Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to this webinar, which is the infection, which is titled Infection Reduction in the ICU. And it's a hypothesis based on Mr. Cato's five step up model. So the two speakers we have today are working in tandem on a project. Kevin, if you can just flick that forward, thanks. So Kevin has worked as a statistical consultant and improvement advisor, coaching managers and frontline leaders, uh, frontline teams to improve quality and value. And Dr. Paolo Borum, uh, MD, has practiced as a vascular surgeon. He has served as a patient safety officer, improvement advisor, and directed multiple improvement collaboratives. He is currently a senior director at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement Leading Projects in Brazil. Now, just before they get started, what I really like about this is that I've had a, a bit of involvement with Kevin through the workshops we've done and some one-on-one -on -one discussions. And uh, what I think Kevin's doing really, really well is he's avoiding copying what I've said or what I've done, probably because our fields are completely different. So he's avoiding copying that, those things and more so he's taking the principles and philosophies of the step up model and applying them um, to, a particular, uh, to a particular situation in healthcare. So rather than me keep talking, I'll hand over to Kevin and uh, he will take you through this. I've been looking forward to hearing what he's had to say for quite some time. Okay. Well, thank you, Oscar. Is my audio okay now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. good. All right. So thank you for the invitation. And I've learned so much from you over the past uh, almost 12 months now in uh, Mr. Cato's model. And today, what we're going to talk about is a project uh, that Dr. Borem, uh, my colleague Paolo, has been leading, and he has invited me. And so we're going to tag team some slides and just go through some background first, and then we'll give you some introduction to why we think Mr. Cato's hypothesis is so useful in the ICU, which is intensive care units. So this is a healthcare application. It's a bit different than some of the assembly operations and manufacturing examples that Oscar has shown me. And so that's what we're working on. So with that, uh, Paolo, I'll move the, the, the slides and then you can give the introduction and we're, we'll go back and forth a bit. Is that okay? You ready, Paolo? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. So uh, Oscar and, and Kevin, thank you so much for the invitation. And so let's uh, talk a, a little bit about this, the project challenge that we have. Uh, after three years working with 114 public ICUs in Brazil to reduce ventilator associated pneumonia, catheter associated urinary, urinary tract, central line associated bloodstream infection using the Institute for Health Care Improvement model, model for improvement. So after these three years, the aggregated data showed the reduction of 53% in, in all these three infections in great improvement in, process, in the, all the processes the compliance. So because of the success of this wave, the Ministry of Health in Brazil, IHI, and five excellent hospitals in Brazil decide to include 200 more ICUs to achieve the same aim in the next two years. And so th this first wave with 114 uh, ICUs, we started in, in 2018 and we finished in, in December 2020. The first wave showed a great potential as shown in this chart. So we used uh, the data for all the 114 hospitals and create this uh, Schuher chart that shows a reduction of 70% in, in the urinary uh, tract infections. So the challenge now is to zero, to reach zero, zero in this infection and no, not go back to the, the baseline that was 4.5 infection per thousand days uh, of catheter. The question Kevin and I are asking ourselves if, if the, the Cato five steps help can help these hospitals to achieve zero and not go back to the baseline that is 4.5, was 4.5 and now is 1.4. Mm -hmm. Kevin? Great. Yeah, so just a little bit of background. Uh, our projects have not been traditionally tightly in the lean Toyota production system method, but uh, we've learned enough 
and we have enough background. So I wanted to give you just one or two minutes of where we're coming from and how we've bridged over to what Mr. Cato is telling us. So Joseph Duran is one of the people who's influenced our approach to quality. And he talked about three pieces of work. You got to manage the work. So in the ICU, you got to take care of patients. You've got to improve the work. As Paolo showed, we have to continue to reduce infections. And then we've got to figure out how to build systems that are actually going to manage quality long term. And that's a lot of what Mr. Cato is talking about. So this seems very compatible with what we've learned in the past, what we call quality control, quality improvement, and quality planning. One of the things we've also learned over the years before we learned from Oscar about Mr. Cato is that these pieces have to fit together, right? It is not a list. And so I drew a little picture that I got from a teacher, uh, Noriaki Kano, 30 years ago, that shows how quality control fits with quality improvement. It's like launching a rocket ship, and then you better be able to land it back on planet Earth again. And planet Earth is the standard work on quality control. We have a hypothesis before I knew about Mr. Cato's step up that you need a management system to get quality control. We believe that and that quality control depends on standardized work. So our first initial thought was, oh, this all the things that the lean people talk about and some of our other Japanese teachers about standardized work, that's, that's really gonna help us if we wanna do this ICU challenge. But then we learned more about Mr. Cato's approach and he showed us uh, and I'm not going to go in detail here. There's a reference. Oscar has a very nice uh, video produced uh, for Lean Frontiers. Lean Frontiers has been very generous in offering free, great stuff. So go check on that video. You'll get an introduction from Oscar about all the step ups. But this slide is just to remind you that Mr. Cato is looking at five step ups. And what's important about this diagram is the work, the actual work is the foundation of everything. And step up one, which is what we're going to talk more about today, is translating the work that has to be done in the ICU into something that Mr. Cato calls work standards. One of the things we learned is that there's three flavors of work standards, and we'll talk a little bit about the translation to the healthcare setting of work standards for the output quality, work standards for mach machining or processing of, of uh, materials and inputs, and then what the people do. So we, we commend this uh, to your study. If you haven't looked at this, it's, it's well worth it. Now, one of the things that we have also learned, as Oscar said, is that the um, ICU care in particular is not exactly identical to product assembly. So there are some details in the presentation. I have just a little red circle here that talks about tact, which is the timing of production and the sequence of work tasks and work in process. Those detail methods don't apply as far as we can tell. So I've got some additional information in the slide uh, comments about how we're thinking about uh, those ideas in the ICU. But nonetheless, the big picture we think fits perfectly. So we're gonna try to make that case for you in the next 20 minutes or so. All right, uh, so we've revised our hypothesis. And our revised hypothesis is that quality control depends on standardized work. Standardized work requires work standards, step up one. And so we need to build on the work standards. And we think that using Mr. Cato's insights that we can meet this challenge if 200 more ICUs and that we can actually use this intervention to apply to other things in the intensive care unit. It's not just infection control, they do many other things, but we think if we learn how to do this, it'll be a great foundation. So with that, I think, uh, Paolo, let me turn it over to you, why we think this will fly in the ICU. Go ahead. So, yeah, we, uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, we have a lot of uh, reasons to be very optimistic about it. Uh, first of all, because, uh, and you, you can see in this picture, we have almost 100 people that were training on the basics of the model for improvement. They know how to run 
PDSC cycles. They know how to create a standard work, etc. So they know very well how to use the model for improvement. And also, um, we have people in Brazil that was uh, taught the model for improvement uh, from my IHG, I taught a lot of people to teach the model for improvement, and so they are very experienced in in, in teaching the model for improvement. And it seems that Cato's method uh, should simplify the training and problem solving in this in this ICUs, because the challenge now is. Uh, beyond this 114 that we, we worked for three years, now we have to do two waves of 200 more ICUs. So we need to get it simpler for everyone. So yeah, I think we, we, we are very optimistic about uh, this next wave. Kevin. So uh, uh, Paula, do you want to say a little bit more about the model for improvement? That may be jargon because that's how we see the world and maybe some people on the uh, the webinar haven't seen this before. It won't be a shock, but this is just a formulation we use. Take take another minute. I think we've got yeah. time just to walk through that. Thank you. Yeah, so the, uh, we have three questions that we always do when we face a challenge. For example, we have a lot of infections in the ICU. So we put together 100 hospitals and say, okay, together, we're going to reduce infection in by half in three years. So the first question that we ask is, what are we trying to accomplish? In this case, is to reduce infection by half in three years. So the second question that we ask is, how will we know that a change is an improvement? And for that, we use a family of measures. For example, uh, infection rate, in process measures like bundle compliance, how many patients have the bed elevator, how many patients uh, had oral, oral hygiene, things like this. So we create measures to prove that the change was an improvement. And the third question is, what change we can make that we result in improvement? In this case, are the bundles. Make the bed elevator, do hand, hy hand hygiene, oral hygiene. After we answer these three questions, we ask people to test this, this change using the PDSA cycle and use study invasive check instead of check. So that's the basic of the model for improvement. Kevin, I don't know if you want to add anything. Uh, yeah. This explanation. Well, no, no, that's, that's perfect, Paolo. And for those of you who are practiced in lean and you use A3 discipline, we figured out that you can map this model for improvement over to A3. That you can, they're not identical, but they touch the same concept. So if you're familiar with using A3, uh, it works the same way. One reason, as Paulo said, we're optimistic is that many people are familiar in Brazil with PDSA, measuring, thinking about aims, and then contrasting. It's having a hypothesis, right? We don't know enough to know for sure. We have to be scientists. And so this is a scientific method. So uh, Paolo, that's good. And then there was another reason for optimism, which is, as you said, teams have been doing a lot of work with regular um, practice to make different parts of healthcare reliable. And you've got another example that just shows some really great progress. So let me give you the next slide and you can talk a little bit about this one. Yeah, uh, this is another project that we just finished in, in Brazil. And instead of reducing infection, we want to reduce maternal mortality. And, and so we worked with 19 uh, public hospitals. Use, and you use, in this case, you use job instruction to train the this, this staff, for, uh, this staff for, uh, for example, to identify women with clinical deterioration and how to apply all the bundles to prevent hemorrhage, sepsis, and eclampsia. So before this, this projects and before this training, uh, they did not have a standard work for any of these bundles or treatments. So everybody was uh, treating hemorrhage in a different way or they were not following any standard process. So for four months, I, I taught them how to break down the jobs, create the standard process, and how to and how to teach the standard process. So the result was 80% reduction in mortality in sepsis and hemorrhage, 
and and we have now 10, 10 families continue to receive mother's hugs because they did not die. So that's the number of mothers we saved with this, this project. And it lasts two years and we are super happy with these results. And you can see in these two charts, the, the, the first chart on the, the top is the bundle compliance in meals. And the second is maternal mortality all Together, it reduced 40%, but when you consider just sepsis and hemorrhage, each one of these reduced 80%. Okay, thank you. So the last reason, anticipating now, remember, Mr. Cato has five step-ups, and we're just, we're focused on step-up one. We're going to give you a little bit more uh, in the next few minutes on how we translate our ICU work into step-up one. But looking ahead to step up two, step up two says, once you've organized your work and have described it clearly, make it easy for the people doing the jobs to tell whether things are abnormal, right? Step up one is all about defining what you want, what is normal. Step two is, let's make it easy. Let's design the work and the workplace to make it easy to see when things are not going according to your standards. That, that's huge because already Paolo has been working with people on having beautiful training matrices like you see uh, over to the right. So this is a training matrix. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. You list key tasks and then you color in the circles on skill level. And many of you will have seen a, a fishbone diagram for problem solving. Okay. One of the promises we believe of Mr. Cato's method is that we can simplify both of these. Training is infinite. You can think about all the things you could train people on. Well, Mr. Cato says, let's use work standards as the filter. If people don't know how to do a job or they can't do items of the work standard, that's where you start. Well, that's good. That helps. The second is, if we make a really good workplace design, it should simplify problem solving. We don't have to send one of Paolo's 100 advisors out to each of the hospitals. The team can solve so many problems themselves. So we're very optimistic that the work standard lens can simplify things. All right, let me, I'm watching the clock here, Oscar. So let me, let me proceed. Thanks, Kevin, well done. I can yeah. see that. You're doing <laughs> okay. a good job. You're doing a great job. All right. So uh, as Paolo said, there's, our focus is many kinds of infections. But I'm just going to illustrate because Paolo helped teach me. I'm not a doctor. He was teaching me about one kind. One kind is uh, ventilator-associated pneumonia. So if you have a vent, and now many people from COVID this past year have seen pictures of tubes down people's uh, throat and into their lungs to enable them to breathe, you can get an infection. It's not a good thing to do to have a, a ventilator. So we're just going to talk about the ventilator piece of it. But the other kinds of infections, there's similar um, uh, problems and opportunities. All right. So first of all, healthcare has lots of flowcharts, has lots of documents. That's not the problem. The challenge is how do you organize it in a way to make it easier for the nurses, the doctors, the respiratory therapists, the assistants to actually do the work according to the plan. So Here's a plan, a flow chart, right? It's in Portuguese, but you get the picture, which is you have choices. There's, so we have lots of these kinds of documents. In this case, for ventilator acquired pneumonia, the first step is only use a ventilator when it's necessary. So we would need to know how to define when does a patient need it or not in a way that makes it easy for people to see. And then for ventilated patients, these uh, items one through six already exist. So we're not starting from zero. I hope you don't have the sense that healthcare is completely without standards. There are standards and policies. But what we need to do is then take this and build it into the work. All right, so work standard one. What's work standard one? It really is defining service quality. And I am shocked and embarrassed to tell you that many times in my consulting, I don't emphasize this step, but I think it's critical. 
from the patient's perspective and the family's perspective, what is our service quality? Service quality is work standard one. How do we translate the service into a statement that families, patients, at the doctors and nurses can all agree on? We have a tentative one, just, just to get us started, that patients should not get ventilator-required pneumonia. If they're in our care, they shouldn't get this bad thing, right? That's a, a service uh, uh, guarantee, perhaps. It also highlights in the importance of knowing, can we detect when somebody has ventilator-required pneumonia or not? And we were discussing, Paolo and I, with uh, this slide with another physician a couple of weeks ago, Paolo, and this is when Dr. Goldman said, there's some discussion about whether we should do pneumonia or ventilator associated events. So we have to have a definition. If we're gonna do service quality, we better have an agreement about how to measure. So, so that's, that's something we need to pay attention to. Work standard two is all about, the, how I've interpreted it is all about the physical environment. What are the physical settings and the environmental conditions to achieve the desired outcome? In this case, you, we have several. There are things like the bed has to be at the right angle, right? Can't be too elevated and it can't be flat, uh, except for patients who are being treated a certain way. So we have to have rules. How easy is it for anybody to see that angle? You see my little uh, black angle there. It has to be 30 to 45 degrees. In the old days, what would we do? Our usual habit would be we'd audit and we'd have somebody go around and look and then they'd have to measure and then it's Oscar's opinion is that 47 degrees, it's my opinion, well, it's 44, it's good enough. We should make it easy to see. That's what Mr. Cato is saying. So anybody in the room can tell immediately. It's not just once every 12 hours when you audit, you can see. The second piece is uh, some things around pressure. There are, how would you adapt that instrument so that it's easy for anybody to see whether the uh, pressure is in the right um, range? So we think there's a perfect mapping to work standard two in the ICU. In um, work standard three, this is where we have always gone first, which I think is a mistake. Mr. Cato says, start with step up work standard one and step up work standard two. But this is what we're used to. Here's do these steps to clean uh, the trachea so that people don't get infections. Because if this part of your body is clean, you're less likely to get a bad virus or bacteria that's going down into your lungs. So this is something that we've had already that Paolo has shared with me. To make it a work standard, however, we have to define clean. What's clean? How would you know a tube is clean? How is the bottom of the mouth clean? So the, the work standard could have many pictures, could have many documents, could have some other things that support this intention. So work standard three, we're, we know all about this, but we have to get better at having operational definitions. So um, we're convinced actually that Oscar, that, that the clarity of Mr. Cato's three flavors, if you will, of work standards can really help us in terms of our training, in terms of our problem solving, in terms of getting ready uh, to help a hundred because we ha we're trying to go to scale here, right? It's not just one ICU, it's multiple ICUs across a very large country. And we're, we're, we're really excited that uh, this may be the way our platform to, to make this happen. So, um, Paolo, you can talk uh, on the next slide a little bit about the, the next steps. Obviously, I think people know that Brazil is experiencing some heavy COVID infections right now. And so our ability to launch this work in the ICU, we have to pay attention. But why don't you give a couple of comments, please, about the, the, our next steps? Yeah, th thank you, Kevin. Y yes, the, the country now is facing a terrible moment you know the 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 hospitals are completely full in in but we hope that we're going to start the next phase in june july and the ministry of health uh, agreed to include two waves of 200 hospitals that means more than 800 people needs to be trained every cycle 
and we need we need to create all this this first of all the work standard for the new ICUs and then standard work for every single element of the bundle. So, but uh, uh, we are very optimistic and we hope that we're gonna start in, in, in June, July. The challenge here is, is the scale. You know, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna put all these people together to teach this, this five steps, et cetera. So that's, that's where we are now. And we hope that 400 more ICUs are gonna be trained in the next four years. Thanks, Paolo. One of the things, uh, Oscar, that Paolo has been very uh, interested in learning about, and they've already experimented, he mentioned job instruction. So there are other aspects uh, that support Mr. Cato's step-up model that we're also going to leverage as much as we can. So Paolo's learning about, uh, he's taking the training and to be a you know, master job instructor. And we want to use that and he's practiced it already because again, how will you make so many of these items require clarity about what are you doing? How should you do it? And why should you do it? And so uh, we're looking to leverage other things that we've learned from you and your colleagues, Oscar, to, to help go to scale. It's, it's pretty uh, daunting and exciting. I'm looking at the clock. I have a, a one more slide. Did you want to uh, ask a question or comment? No, no, your timing's perfect. If you can do that slide yeah. and then I'll quickly wrap up right. and okay. we'll Very right good. in the 30 minutes. Well, All then. right, good. All right, so I want to just, uh, for those in the audience who are uh, accustomed to manufacturing examples, healthcare is uh, often people say, well, it's different. Right, a human body treating an ill patient is different than building a, a product in a, in a factory. And we believe that that's right. There's a lot of complexity in humans. Uh, the psychology, the fact that you're dealing with a person who has feelings and emotions. Uh, for those of you who work on job relations, you know that there's a whole aspect of how do you interact with people? Well, in healthcare, when somebody's in pain and afraid, wow, it's really challenging. There are other people who've worked on thinking about work standards, and I'll just offer this one slide. So Dr. Brent James, recently retired from a health system in the US, worked on an idea that might appeal to doctors, right? So we, we have to be uh, sensitive to how we present this kind of information so that the doctors don't say, oh, well, that's, we're not a factory, right? So, so Dr. James has presented some ideas and I have a link there. I see a lot of overlap between what Dr. James invented over many years and his health system has explored lean as well. So if you're interested and you're in healthcare and you don't know about Dr. James, you should click that link and learn some more. So, okay, I'm done, Oscar, back to you. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks, uh, Paolo. That was exceptional. <laughs> it's four o'clock in the morning over here, and I was very, very glad I got up. I know I could have watched the recording, but I'm glad I got up, A, to introduce you, and B, to listen to that. I really like the comparison you did to Duran right at the start, because um, one of the things I've learned over the years is that things make sense when uh, there's overlap or links to fundamental philosophies. They tend to make sense. So I really like the bit you, that introduction you did there with that comparison. The other thing I've really picked up on is you mentioned several times, particularly in the middle, about the need to have a scientific approach to this and to be scientists. Mm -hmm. And I think that concept of the work standard and, a, and, deter, and a clearly communicating normal abnormal increases the uh, efficiency, if you like, of being a scientist, of mm -hmm. true scientific thinking. So that's the other thing I've picked up on. Really well done. So uh, thank you very much. I know you've put some quite a lot of time and effort into this, both of you. And I think you've been rewarded in that. And I'm sure that everyone who was watching felt the same. That was exceptional. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. I'm glad we've been able to help. Oh, sorry. The other thing, I love the way you tied in um, a number of other philosophies and principles that you can see are going to be pulled into this the work that you're doing. And the best part about it is that there's going to be a lot of Brazilians who are going to be healthier <laughs> And Paolo, I love that comment you made about mums giving hugs. I thought that was terrific. Really well, that, that gave us that human factor. So really well done. Thank, thank, you for, thank you very much to both of you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Well done. Bye-bye. Thank you.